Hello, my name is Dr Catherine Hall. I work in the Schools and Human Audiences team at the British Museum. And welcome to our presentation by Share Museums East on SEN learning in museums. And what I'd like to do during our time together today is to have a think about the ways that you can introduce and build your SEN offer in your art or heritage organisation. And we're going to do this by looking at some interventions we've made here at the British Museum, taking you through some of the processes we have followed, sharing some top tips about easy wins, and hopefully giving you a few ideas that you can then transfer into your own practice. And I'd like to begin by looking at the issue of SEN resources. Now, aside from any particular workshop or teaching session that you might be running in the museum, one of the biggest barriers we know for SEN audiences engaging with the heritage sector is access. If your audience can't get to you, it doesn't matter how good your programme is. So one of the first things we did at the British Museum when we were looking to build our SEN offer was to do a simple audit of what was already in place. And very often, these facilities have been put in place for other audiences. So for example, you can see here that on the forecourt of the museum, there was an existing agreement that drivers with blue badges and access minibuses could book a parking space on the museum site, which meant that pupils could be brought through the front gates directly to the front door and the minibus can stay there for the duration of their visit. In addition, we had lifts outside taking people from the forecourt up to the colonnade. They get good use from people with push chairs and they're ideal for our students who either use a wheelchair or prefer to use a lift rather than the flight of steps that leads up to the front door of the museum. Inside the museum we had further access provision which we could make use of. Many of our galleries date back to Victorian times and the building is continually changing. In some of the galleries, we have parts of a gallery on a different level to the main section of the gallery. Here you can see an example in the Parthenon Sculpture Gallery, where at either end, the pediment sculptures are displayed on a raised floor. Access requirements have meant that a lift has been put in place to take visitors between the two changes of floor level. Only three steps, but impossible to negotiate if you're in a wheelchair. If we're working with students who are studying ancient Greek, these lifts mean that we can access all parts of the Parthenon Sculpture Gallery, look at the frieze, the metopes, and get up close with the pediment sculptures. So a quick audit of your site may well reveal that you have infrastructure already in place that you can make use of as an educator. The other thing to look at is what agreements you might already have in place with regard to gallery work. Now in our ancient Egyptian galleries, very popular topic with our mainstream and SEN audiences, we have a touch tour. The touch tour is a selection of objects, mostly granite, which have been signed off by the curators for use by visually impaired visitors and also SEN groups. The fact that they have been signed off for touch means that not only can we get up close to these objects with the students and enable them to feel and investigate the surface of the sculptures, but we can also then use these objects as part of bigger projects and workshops. Now here you can see that we are wrapping one of our ancient Egyptian lions as part of an SEN project for a sunken cities exhibition. And what we are doing is we're recontextualizing these objects by putting them back under the sea 
wrapping them in layers of different blue fabrics and tissue papers. We're able to do this because there was already an agreement in place. And all I had to do was check that the curator was happy for us to use acid-free fabric and tissue in this way. And we were all set to go. At the moment, we're very aware that everyone is under pressure in terms of time, in terms of budget, in terms of staff. So another one of my top tips would be to look around you at your partnerships. A lot of our SEN work is delivered in partnerships with local partners. For example, each year we are part of a Deaf Discovery Day, which is hosted at the British Library, just up the road from us at Euston. We're then able to invite into this space other partners, small art galleries, small heritage organisations, and we can set up stalls across the whole of the public space in the library to deliver a whole day of family fun delivered in spoken English and BSL. So partnership work is often a way that you can make an in-kind contribution perhaps in terms of your staff time or your resources, and other partners can make in-kind contributions in a way that suits them. For example, the British Library, their in-kind contribution is the whole of their beautiful public space for us to populate. Continuing with this idea of how you can make use of existing platforms, we wanted to make sure but what we were offering to SEN schools, information about the sessions, about booking, about what was available when you visited, was easily available to teachers. Again, it goes back to this idea of it doesn't matter how good your offer is, if no one knows about it, they're not going to take part. So we looked at the learning pages on our British Museum website. We already had a number of pages looking at particular curricular areas. So for example, we'd grouped all our resources for ancient Egypt, for ancient Greece. We had pages that spoke to our secondary school audience. And we set up another page using exactly the same template, exactly the same wireframe, which spoke to our SCN and our access audience. And this gave us a single point on the website where we could gather together all the resources, be they screen text, be they downloadable PDFs, be they slideshows. But we wanted our SEN audience to be able to access quickly and easily. In addition, we could look at where we had templates for our mainstream resources that we could populate specifically for our SEN audience. So we have a number of guides about how you can use the ancient Egyptian galleries, worksheets and activity suggestions. So using the same template, we wrote one specifically for a teacher visiting with SEN students. We were able to tailor the activity suggestions and the teacher support information to the needs of that particular audience. In addition, we'd heard from teachers that one of the things they like to have available before they come out on an off-site visit is information which helps to orientate the students and let them know what is in store. I tend to think of it as not keeping it secret. Share as much information as you can. So to do this, we used the PowerPoint templates that we had for our ordinary school image bank resources, and we wrote a number of social stories, photographs of what the students would see when they arrived at the museum, as they went through the front door, as they went into different galleries. These were then loaded onto the website page. Teachers could either run them through their whiteboard in the classroom, or print them out. And in fact, on one occasion, I was taking a group round 
and I saw that one of the students was holding a printed copy of the PowerPoint stapled into a little book and as the day went on the teacher was pointing out which part of the day they'd got to. We got ready for lunch and the teacher turned through to the photograph of me sitting in the school lunchroom pretending to eat a bag of crisps. Nearly lunchtime, she said to the student. It's all about adding context, giving the information that is going to make both the student and the teacher comfortable throughout the visit. I think it's also very important that if you as an organisation are building your SEN provision, that part of what you are doing as, as an organisation is advocating for that audience, making that audience visible within your organisation. This may mean that when you're working in galleries, the audience you are working with is seen by all visitors to the gallery. It also means that you can make this audience visible on the website. For example, when we advertise for particular events, and I have here an example of one of our under five workshops, you have a suite of photos that you can send through that become the image for that workshop or that event. So I suppose in a way that's a bit of an audit. What does your website look like to your audiences? Can they see themselves and can other visitors see them? Does this mean that other visitors are aware of the audiences that you value? Can they see them on your website and in your galleries? I'm also a strong believer in making sure that everyone at the museum, be these visitors or other members of staff, see the full range of approaches used in SEN work. This may be as simple as seeing how SEN schools are making use of modern technology to support their students. It may be, as in the picture you can see to the right, people seeing the use of other communication styles, BSL, being used. When this group from a local deaf school came down to the museum to start an arts project in one of our exhibitions, it had an interesting impact on the staff who were showing visitors in and checking the tickets. A number of them came up afterwards and said that they themselves had hearing difficulties. One of the members of visitor services revealed he was actually completely deaf in one ear and was actually very inspired to see us working with deaf children in the museum. In a way, it made him feel that the museum was for him as well. It's amazing the impact of making that audience visible across your organisation. And this set us to thinking, can we have a backpack that supports the sensory needs of any young visitor who would need extra support to navigate our museum? There are some things we can't change. We can't change the fact that some, museum, that some galleries are very bright. We can't change the fact that some galleries are incredibly noisy, particularly if they've got popular objects in them. So what we decided to do was to create a set of flashcards, at the top of which was an issue that we thought people might want to address, an aspect of the museum environment that they may want to change. For example, is it too dark in this gallery? If it is, we suggested they get the torch out of the sensory support backpack. Or we suggested that if they were finding the dark quite difficult, they might want to move to one of our very light galleries, soak up some natural light in the Great Court. So a variety of approaches that they could use to either modify the environment in that gallery, if it was too bright, you can pop a pair of sunglasses on, or an opportunity to just move to another space, 
that would make you feel more comfortable and less anxious. Inside our sensory support bag, we have all sorts of tools that people can use. And although we have the flashcards, at the end of the day, it's for the family to self-select what works for them. The Tangle toy, which is really useful if you've got fiddly fingers or you're feeling very tempted to touch the objects, might also go into your mouth if you are feeling anxious. Everything is easy to clean and everything is easy to replace. What matters is that you've offered something for the audience and they feel valued. It also means that if they come on a return visit, they might feel more comfortable to bring their own interventions with them. People often think when they come to the museum that they can't bring anything into the building. But if, for example, you have a comfort blanket, a weighted blanket, that every now and again you just need to put around your shoulders, why not bring it in a backpack? And if you need a bit of downtime, sit on a bench in the Great Court, hop on your weighted blanket. It's about letting the audience know that they have the right to modify the environment in ways that work alongside the expectations of the museum in terms of public visitors. They have more control. That is going to make people feel more welcomed. And it's also going to be an interesting way for you to observe the modifications that people are bringing with them and then seeing if you can build them back into your own practice. With this in mind, we also looked at our mainstream workshops. And as you know, special needs do not just come through special schools. Mainstream schools have special needs students with a variety of needs. In the past, we've been asked if we can wear a microphone because a student has a cochlear implant. We've been asked if we can provide resources in extra large text because one of the students is visually impaired. We listened to all of these, we thought about what we could do, and we created what we call our workshop access boxes. Now these aren't an answer to everything, but they mean that if a class arrives, we have some tools which we can put at the disposal of the teacher to help them ensure that all students are engaged. So we got some handheld magnifiers, the sort that people often use if they want to increase the print on a library book they're reading. This means that any worksheets or written labels that are being used as part of the workshop can be magnified by the student right there and then. We also put in some light buttons that you can buy to decorate your house. What we do is we use it for students who are either hard of hearing or for students on the autistic spectrum scale who need a bit more time to change activities. So for example, you can put the light button on the table where the student is working. The teacher leading the session has the controls. And when you've got to the point where you're about to change to another activity, you can remotely change the buttons from green to amber. This is just a little visual hint that in a moment we're gonna stop doing this. I can then make it red, we've stopped. It means that you're providing close up and bespoke information for that student that enables them to follow the flow of the workshop that everyone else in the class is following without thinking about. Additional, discreet, clever support. We also included some notes which the teachers could read through because some interventions are very simple. And again, it goes back to this idea of not everyone likes to ask and not everyone thinks they are allowed to ask. So for example, 
on the cards, it says, if you have a student who is hard of hearing, move them to the front of the group when the workshop starts. Teachers can select where they want pupils to sit. We say come in, come in, sit down. But if a teacher thinks the student needs to sit in a particular place in relation to the person delivering, they can do that. So again, the cards are suggesting to the teachers ways in which they can modify the workshop setup simply, quickly, quietly, in a way that not only supports the students, but actually, dare I say, supports the person delivering the workshop, because they know all the students are getting full access to everything they are saying or showing. We do deliver a number of SEN workshops throughout the year. These sit alongside our mainstream workshops. They're delivered in the autumn, spring and summer term and are bookable in exactly the same way as any of our mainstream workshops. And I think this would be one of my other top tips. Is don't try and reinvent the wheel. When we started our SEN workshops, we decided that everything the SEN teacher and the SEN student did in the museum would mirror what our mainstream schools did. They book using the same booking system. They speak to the same ticket team. When they arrive, they all go to the school lunchroom to check in in the same place. They have their locker space alongside the other schools. So in essence, we didn't have to put another layer of infrastructure on top of the one we already had. We slotted these sessions in. At times, you do need to modify the offer that is available in your space. One example of this would be that when we're working with students who are in wheelchairs, we have to make sure that the galleries we use, we've checked so that we know the objects are accessible at their level. So sometimes you do have to do that audit beforehand, going round with a different learning template in your head, saying, if I was lower down, if I had less sight, if I had less hearing, is this gallery going to give me the best learning opportunity that it can? We also bring into our workshops as many contextual resources as we can. In the image on the left, you can see Dina learning about the goddess Athena. And we've been looking at a statue of Athena on her horse. So to make sense of Athena's horse, and also to skill us up with some vocabulary when we go to the Parthenon gallery later, and see the parade of horses through ancient Athens in honour of Athena's birthday, we get out our toy horses, we've got soft cuddly horses that you can squeeze and hold close, we've got harder plastic horses that don't get damaged if they're thrown across the room, that can be wiped down if they're licked, we've got some dried raffia that we get out to feed our horses, we've got a sound button with the sound of a horse neighing. So lots of multi-sensory resources that help to contextualize and build understanding around the concept of, in this case, the horse. So that when we arrive in the Parthenon galleries and we've gone up to the cast reliefs, which are allowed to touch in the slip galleries, and we start to talk about horse, it immediately makes sense. And if we want to, we can take a gallery bag with us and have a couple of the resources from the workshop in the gallery bag to remind ourselves. We can get our toy horse back out again. We can get our sound button back out again. There's nothing like adding a bit of noise to a quiet gallery to bring it to life. Some of our SEN workshops happen almost exclusively in the gallery space itself. And here you can see 
a workshop for pupils with profound and multiple learning difficulties in our Enlightenment Gallery. And our Enlightenment Gallery carries a wide range of objects which represent the British Museum's collections going back to its foundation in 1753. So it's the only part of the museum where the British Museum has got some fossils and some dinosaurs. So in this part of the gallery, we were doing a workshop all about the seaside, about sea life. We could look at the shells on display. We could get out a huge piece of blue fabric and wave it up and down, wave it over the heads of our wheelchair users, pretending we were under the sea ourselves. So again, this goes back to the idea of taking a gallery bag full of resources with you as the teacher into that gallery. And one of the things we're looking at developing are gallery bags that schools can pick up from the school lunchroom and take into the gallery themselves. So they can self facilitate this sort of experience. And that may be for an SEN group, or it may be for a mainstream class where perhaps they have children who are sight impaired, who can see the shell through the glass case, but have a better understanding of it if they're looking at it while they're also holding a shell in their hand. I think one of the key things about SEN work, a very simple aspect of the work that is often overlooked, is that when you're working with an SEN audience, they're going on the same learning journey as any mainstream audience. But what you need to do is to support that journey by adding in things that will enable them to learn to the best of their ability. That may be using multi-sensory resources. It can also be things as simple as allowing time for engagement and response. You might need to allow a pause that is perhaps five or 10 or 20 times longer than you might usually expect to leave in a workshop to allow the students to focus in on the experience, to engage in the experience, and then respond to the experience. With this in mind, we only ever have one SEN workshop bookable in any one day. This means that we can spend the day going at the pace of the students and the teacher and enable everyone to get the most out of their visit. I would say that what you might lose in numbers, you gain in the quality of the experience and that shows in the feedback we get from teachers. And that's all part of your role as an advocate for the audience. We talked earlier about making any engagement with objects, particularly objects that are in a glass case, multi-sensory when you're working with an SEN audience. Now, glass cases are a bit of a mixed blessing. Most of the objects at the British Museum are in glass cases. And people often think that means they're not very engaging. You, you, you can't touch them. Well, to be honest, you wouldn't want the students touching them. They're often fragile. They're often actually not suitable for touching. They've got broken or conserved surfaces. And what a glass case does is it means that those objects are protected. And as an educator, I sometimes find that glass cases mean that both I and the teacher can relax no one can touch anything. The students can go close up to the glass, can spend as long as they like looking at the object. And we don't have to say don't touch. They can't. But what we can do is we can enhance that experience by bringing things into the gallery. And here you can see a student using our mesolithic gallery bag. And this goes with some objects we have on display from Star Car, a Mesolithic site 
in Yorkshire. We've introduced items for people using Starcar as a hunting and a semi-permanent settlement site would have had around them in their world. So we've got a pot of honey for sniffing, even perhaps a little taste, of a bit of honey on your finger. We've got some little bee puppets who can fly around so we can think about where honey would have been collected from. We've got some mushrooms to represent the fungus, the dried fungus in the case. We've got some hazelnuts to represent the hazelnut shells. So what we can do is we can sit in front of the star car case and we can get out all of these resources and really bring life at star car in the Mesolithic period to life. And then we pack more back into the gallery bag. And I tell you, I never have any shortage of students who'd like to carry my gallery bag for me. And we can set off to our next object. Always make your resources portable. Always make them easy to carry and not too heavy. The other top tip I would say is if you're buying backpacks, these see-through backpacks are really useful because you can see exactly where the resources are and which bag is which when you go to pick them up from the resources cupboard. It also means that visitor services staff who are on duty in the galleries, as well as seeing me, a known member of the education team working with the students, can also see what is inside the bag. And that cuts down on the perceived security risk of bags in galleries. They can see their education resources, they relax. Next to the Mesolithic Gallery, we have the Sutton Hoo Gallery. And the objects from Sutton Hoo are displayed in a large central glass case. And again, when we're looking at Sutton Hoo, we have a gallery bag to support us. And what I'm trying to do with these resources is to bring the feel, the sound, the weight, the sight of those Sutton Hoo objects into the immediate world of the students. So here we've got a very simple pin device. It's one of those devices you've often seen where people put their hand in and the handshake pops out on the other side. The ends of the pins are all rounded so you can put them up against your face and suddenly you're wearing the Sutton Hoo helmet. Teachers love it. It's an opportunity for them to take a photo that they can then take back to school, not only to record their visit, but also then to remind the students of what they did on the visit. You can put it on top of your hand and you're wearing a medieval glove. If we're studying the Battle of Hastings, everyone can get their medieval gauntlet on with our pin board. We can also bring sounds into the experience. I bought some metal dishes and modern culinary dishes often used when people are serving curries. What they are is quite a good approximation of some of the dishes that were found in the Sutton Hoo burial. They're shiny, they're smooth, they've got handles that you can hold. You can feel the weight of them when you pick them up. We can then add in some spoons. There were silver spoons at Sutton Hoo, so here's another object being used with the bowl. We can move the spoon round. It scrapes, it makes a sound. We also added in a small piece of chain mail. There was some chain mail found at Sutton Hoo, so it links to the objects, but put it in with the spoon and suddenly you have a whole world of silver coloured, noisy metal objects to be explored, to be investigated with no wrong or right answer. But all of it just adding in that contextual multi-sensory information to the objects that we're then asking the students to look at in the glass case. Not all of your objects have to be bought. Here's one I made. You may have a particular object in your gallery that everyone wants to see, that everyone wants to learn about. One of these is the Snettersham Horde from Norfolk. 
And this you will recognize instantly as the great talk from the Snettersham Horde. They're on public display and once again they're behind glass. So you can spend a long time looking at them, you can lean right up against the glass, press your nose, kneel down, look at the talk from different angles, and then what we do to contextualise the object you've just been looking at is get out our crocheted Great Snettersham talk. I crocheted it with yellow wool, filled it with some toy wadding, and ran through the centre of it a piece of thick aluminium wire. I crocheted two terminals which I added on. And this means that when we're looking at the torques, out comes the crochet torque for comparison. Also, you can put our crochet torque on. You can actually wear a torque while you are looking at a torque. And one of the comments that one of the teachers made to me, which I had to confess, I hadn't realised when I was making it, was that wearing something around your neck is something that a lot of their PMLD students do if they have support between their shoulder and their neck. So it's actually copying a way of wearing fabric or support around your body that the students are used to. And because it's made from wadding and wool and is very soft, if they have any line feeding or medicine lines, it doesn't damage any of their medical infrastructure when they put it on. So in conclusion, what I think I'd like to sum up with is the idea that your journey in terms of introducing and building your SEN offer can be based on some very simple, doable principles. The first thing I would say is begin by scoping and prioritising. Do your audit of the building, do your audit of your collection, the areas of the curriculum that you intersect with. Decide what you want to prioritise. Don't start with too many targets. Start with just one workshop or one gallery experience that you would like to offer. While you're developing that, listen, talk to teachers, Hear what they have to say. What do they want? What do they need? What is it a good idea to include? Try and test. Try things out. Do pilot schemes. Work with just one school. Work with just one class. Test it, review, evaluate, and then change. It may not go perfectly the first time, but test, test, test. Change, 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 and you will end up with a perfectly polished product. None of our workshops are ever perfect the first time we do them. Every time I teach a workshop, I learn something new. I think of something else I can add in. Being a reflective practitioner is one of the greatest skills you can offer your audience. It's also very inspiring for you because you are continually learning, you are continually improving and you continually are adding to the stock of techniques and skills and tips that you can then share with other colleagues, just as I am with you today. And the final thing I think I'd like to say is enjoy yourself and have fun. This is one of the most inspiring, joyful audiences I work with at the museum. Every group is different. Every workshop is full of learning, but also full of laughter. They are a joyful audience to work with. And I hope that you have as much enjoyment and professional fulfillment from working with your SEN audiences as I do. Thank you very much indeed for joining me.